Hi, and welcome back to our wonderful book, Lifesavers, Spend a Day with 12 Real Life Emergency Service Heroes by Errol Nash and Anna Albero. So last time we looked at uh, the day in the life of a police person, a police officer and a firefighter. Now this week our topic focus is um, doctors and nurses and paramedics. So that is what we're going to look at today. So if we look inside, there's actually loads of people, four in fact, who are relevant to this topic. Let's have a good look. Here we go. Here are our 12 lifesavers. So we've got Surgeon Asan from Pakistan. He performs life-saving operations. We've got Flying Doctor Andrew from Australia. He travels by air to provide emergency medical care. So he's like a real life flying doctor, a bit like um, Zog and Princess Pearl in our story. And then we've got pediatric nurse Cecilia from Spain. She treats poorly babies and children. And we've got paramedic David Lawrence, Lawrence from Switzerland. He is traveling by land to provide emergency medical care. Okay, so paramedics tend to travel in ambulances. So four people. So we're going to start off um, by doing Surgeon Asan from Pakistan. So let's find him. Ooh, now, this one is quite unusual. It does not have page numbers. I do love a page number, so I have to find him like this. Okay, here we go. Right, so. Can the focus there? Here we go. A day in the life of a surgeon. Hello, my name is Asan and I'm a surgeon working in a hospital in Pakistan. I perform operations on people who aren't very well. When I arrive at work in the morning, I visit patients who have been staying overnight to see how they're feeling after their operation. This is called making the rounds. I have days when I carry out operations and other days when I take part in medical research. So when you find out like new things about medicines and how to make people feel better. Fill in paperwork, plan for operations or meet new patients. Before an operation is booked in, we carry out our tests and use equipment like x-ray machines to make sure the patient gets the right treatment. If their problem does need an operation, I tell them what will happen during surgery and answer any questions. Because it's important people know what's going to happen, because that makes them feel better. If you know what's going to happen, you feel much better. If you don't know what's going to happen, then it adds to your worries. I can perform between one and three operations a day, and they can last anything from two, from a few minutes to many hours. A patient is usually put to sleep before they enter the operating room using something called an anaesthetic. And, use, and during the operation, they receive air from a breathing mask. So the anaesthetic sends the body to sleep and the mind to sleep. So the person doesn't have to feel any pain during the oper operation. They don't have to feel um, their body being operated on. Because sometimes they might have to look inside your body. So they're going to have to open a little part of you up and look inside. So if somebody had to have some heart surgery, they'd have to open up the chest and look at the heart and maybe look see what they could do to help your heart and then they'd sew it all up afterwards but you wouldn't want to be awake when that was happening so they give you anesthetic so you can't feel that and you're not awake now which is much better once inside the operating room room i rely on technicians and nurses to pass me the tools i need so they're really important without them he couldn't do his job they also monitor how the patient is doing so that means they keep an eye on and make sure they're they're really closely um looking after them they also monitor how the patient is doing as I operate. It's a team effort to make sure everything runs smoothly and help a patient feel better. So team effort, very important. Let's have a look at the pictures. Here we go. So we wash our hands really well and dress in surgical gowns and gloves before we enter the operating room. In the operating room, my patient's body is covered with a piece of cloth called a sterile drape with only the area to be operated on uncovered. Okay, so sterile means it's like super duper clean because you don't want to bring germs into the operating room. Once the surgery is complete, my patient is moved to the recovery room to rest. So there they are. 
Okay, right, now let's have a look over here. So, my most important kit, a suture needle. I use it to make stitches which hold body tissues together after surgery. So, a bit like when you mend clothes, you mend the hole, don't you? You stitch it together, you sew it together. You can do that to your body. You just have to have a special needle and a special kind of thread. And be highly skilled and trained to do it. You can, Not just anybody can do it, really. Okay, so here we go. Got a protective cap on, got goggles, um, masks, disposable gloves, shoe covers, got a breathing mask. This is an anaesthetic machine. So remember that helps put people to sleep for their operations so they don't have to feel what's going on because you don't want them to be in pain. Operating table. And sometimes it's not even pain. It would just feel a bit strange. Um, then we've got, oh, this is a drip. So um, you might need to be uh, have some special medicines put into you or maybe just some uh, liquids and that will come to you through a drip and then that gets put into your arm um, with a syringe so here's the liquid whatever it might be there are different things that you might need so that's the stand for it uh, we've got the instrument trolley so everything you'll need for the operation goes on the trolley and then the technicians and the nurses will pass them to the surgeon here is the um, all the equipment that would be on the trolley. So you've got the scalpels for cutting, the clamp, you've got scissors, you've got needles, swabs, um, you've got tweezers, all sorts of it, very important things. And you've got an operate, and we've got operating lights up here because you need to be able to see really well. So you have bright lights. And this monitors your blood pressure here. Um, yeah, I think those are the most important things to have a look at there. Okay, right, so that was Day in the Life of a Surgeon, Asan from Islamabad in Pakistan. So now let's have a look. Now we are going to look at a day in the life of a flying doctor. A day in the life of a flying doctor. Hi, I'm Andrew. And I'm based in the Northern Territory of Australia. The crew and I fly from our base to help people who can't travel any other way to get the medical care they urgently need. So sometimes people live really far away. Australia is a really, really big country and some people don't live in the cities. They live really far out. And if they need medical care, it might be really hard to get to them. Uh, especially quickly enough for the medical care that they need so that they fly to them and that way they can get there in time. We tend to all sorts of patients but most of the calls are for intensive care transport when we fly to a remote, that means far away and hard to get to, a remote place and transfer a patient to a hospital. If someone needs our help, it means they are very sick and may need a ventilator to help them breathe. So a ventilator is a special machine that will breathe for someone when they can't breathe for themselves. When we've secured them at the back of the plane, we take off again to the nearest airport. From there, we continue the journey by road to the hospital. We also receive primary trauma calls, which is when we're needed at the scene of a remote incident, such as a road accident. For this, we usually fly in a helicopter instead of a plane. This means we can land nearer to the scene and also on the hospital's roof. So sometimes he flies in a plane and sometimes he flies in a helicopter. So helicopters, they can get much nearer to places because they're smaller transport, okay? And then they can land on a hospital's roof. You can't do that with a plane. Hospitals often tend to have flat roofs so helicopters can land on them and then people who work in the hospital will trot 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 upstairs up to the roof and help take that take the patient out of the air ambulance the um helicopter and then take them into the hospital no matter what the call is for as soon as we get back to base we go through the paperwork and discuss what went well and what could have gone better then we check our equipment is well stocked so that we're ready for the next person that needs us because you don't want to run out of anything really important. So here's Andrew from Alice Springs in Australia. Let's have a look at the pictures. So we've got here, we keep in contact 
With our base by satellite phone, it means we can be updated on how the patient is doing and our base know where we are while we're in the air, okay? So your base is like your main place of work and from there they set off in their planes and helicopters. We often land in such remote parts of Australia that there isn't even a runway. So a runway is where the planes usually go down. When we reach the patient, they are immediately moved onto the plane. If we're concerned about their neck or spine, we place them on a spinal board using a neck brace and leg braces to keep them stable for the journey. So there we go. Some patients need medical care during the journey to the hospital. So the plane is stocked with life-saving equipment such as ventilators to help people breathe when they can't breathe on their own. Okay, let's have a look at this page now. So, my most important kit, an active warming blanket. I use it to warm my patients during flight to prevent dangerously low body temperature. So your body shouldn't go too low in temperature, nor should it go too high. So, let's have a look. There's the special blanket. So it's not just any old blanket, it's a special one. There's the plane. Here's the satellite phone. So satellite phones are very clever. They will work in places where even mobile phones won't work. You've got the oxygen cylinder. So some oxygen and an oxygen mask if people need some oxygen. That's what we breathe in. Trolley, okay, for transporting people. A helmet. Um, it's a defibrillator. So sometimes when your heart stops going, um, then you can kind of shock it back to working again. You've got your personal protective equipment, so masks and gloves. Um, then you've got medicine, you've got your ventilator, they've got their uniforms. Oh, you've got a stethoscope, we know loads about stethoscopes, they're very important. Okay, so lots of different uh, equipment that is very important. Right, now let's find the next one. Oh, let's have a look at our paediatric nurse. So a paediatric nurse looks after little ones. So this is Celia. She's in Madrid in Spain. Here we go. Hello, I'm... Oh, sorry, Cecilia. Hello, I'm Cecilia and I work as a paediatric nurse in a hospital in Spain. Before I start my shift, that's the time that she works... So it's a set amount of time. I meet with the paediatric nurses who have been on duty before me, so that means working before her, to find out what the needs of each child in our care are. Okay, because patients will be in there for a while, so nurses will work for so many hours, so maybe like an eight-hour shift, for example, and then when they go home, the next lot of nurses will take over, but the same patients will be there, so they'll need to know how they're doing. So they'll tell them, oh, this patient... Uh, needs to be checked on um, every half an hour and this patient because they're little ones this patient really likes teddies so if they're feeling sad you know cheer them up with a teddy okay so you can pass on information to the people on the other shift I spend time looking after babies who have been born very small so small that they can fit into the palm of my hand we put them into an incubator which keeps them at a proper temperature and helps them to grow and get better. Other babies may be born bigger but they can have problems breathing so we help them by giving them oxygen until they can breathe on their own. So oxygen for breathing, very important. Some of the older children that come into hospital might have been involved in accidents and need to have surgery or perhaps they feel unwell and cannot eat. We might give them medicine to make them feel better or sometimes we carry out blood tests if we're not sure what's wrong. So your blood can tell, be tested and it can give the scientists lots of information and then the doctors can, from that, they can um, work out what medicine to give you to make you better. I work closely with doctors helping them with anything that's needed from changing bandages to helping them get ready for surgery. Parents get upset and worried when their child is sick, so a big part of being a paediatric nurse is finding the right words to reassure people and make them feel looked after. But our main goal is to make children better so that they can go home and play with their friends, because every child wants to be able to do that. Let's have a look at those pictures. So here we go. It's important that we keep detailed notes about the very small babies in our care to make sure they're 
feeding and growing every day. It's a wonderful feeling to see them doing well. So that's their special hospital chart for the babies. There are the little babies in the incubators. So they can't be outside them at the moment because they're not strong enough yet. I help children of all ages in various ways, from putting on plaster casts to help to helping fix a broken leg or applying a dressing to a wound. So there she is helping out some older children. I work across different parts of the hospital that are designed to help to treat children in lots of ways. I'm part of a big team of doctors and nurses who all work together. So there she is looking after somebody else. And look, they've got a teddy. Teddy's often make you feel better. Right, okay, so let's have a look here now. My most important kit, an incubator. It's essential to a newborn baby as the conditions inside are the same as its mother's body. So some new, some newborn babies, they're born a little bit too early from their mummy's tummies and they're not ready for the outside world yet. So the incubator, it's like giving them a, like a, a place that's like their mummy's tummy and it helps to look after them so that they can still grow strong. And then when they're ready, they can come out of the incubator. When they're in there, they can still be visited by their families and also looked after by the nurses and the doctors as well. Okay, so we've got other essential things. We've got bandages and dressings. We've got goggles and a cap. We call these scrubs. That's what they wear, scrubs. Disposable gloves. Um, we've got the oxygen again, the oxygen cylinder. We've got a light pen, so it's important to have a light, often used for things like testing your eyes, but also for other things too. You never know when you might need a light. We've got a stethoscope, a pen. You've got to write down things on your chart. We've got syringes and needles. We've got a thermometer, that's an oral thermometer, which means it goes in your mouth, oral. Uh, there's the incubator up here. Um, here is a sling for the arm. We've got blood bottles down here. It's a fluid warmer, so they've got to warm up the fluid for the babies and check the blood pressure there. Okay. Oh, and there's the plaster of Paris for making the um, plaster uh, casts to help people mend their broken bones. Okay, right. So, paediatric nurse, a special, special nurse who looks after little ones. Right then. So, let's finish with the paramedic. So, a day in the life of a paramedic. This is David Lawrence in Geneva, Switzerland. Hello, my name is David Lawrence and I drive an ambulance to provide emergency medical care in Switzerland. My day starts at the station as my partner and I check our vehicle to make sure the tyres are in good condition, we have enough fuel and that the blue lights and sirens work. Then we're ready for action. We receive information about emergency calls as text messages on two mobile phones. The messages tell us the address, the patient's age and the reason they need our help. The call can be a category 1, 2 or 3 which tells us how quickly we need to get to the scene and whether or not to use blue lights and sirens. So sometimes it'll be a super emergency, they need to get there really quick so they put on the sirens. Sometimes they need to get there but it's not a super emergency so they don't need to put on the sirens. As soon as we arrive on the scene, we let the control center know we're there. So they're the people coordinating all the 99 calls, 999 calls, missed out a nine there, 999 calls, and then sorting out whether they go to um, the paramedics, whether they go to the firefighters or the police, okay? Um, so we make sure the area we're working in is safe and call the police if we need them. We're of little use to anybody if we are injured ourselves, so they have to keep themselves safe too. If it's a public place, we also have to protect the scene from passers-by, so we don't want people wandering in when people aren't well. The attending paramedic takes the lead at the scene, writing down the patient's history and current condition. So they need to know if they have any medical conditions, so maybe they have a heart condition, or maybe they have asthma, or maybe they are allergic to things. These are all important things to know. It's good to know your medical history. The driving paramedic is just as busy passing the medical kit to help stop bleeding or going back and forth to the ambulance to fetch equipment. We swap roles after every call and work well as a team. So they take it in turns. One is doing the driving and one is the one sort of looking after the patient. And then the next time they go and see a patient, 
they'd swap over. Our goal is to get a patient feeling better and possibly save their life. Let's have a look at the pictures. So here we've got, when we get to the patient, we first assess the situation for dangers and quickly take the patient's history so that we can try and work out what has happened. So here they are. If a patient's life is in danger, we may perform CPR, which keeps their blood and oxygen circulating, going around their bodies until we can get them to the hospital. So here we go. So that's performing CPR there and then putting the mask on them afterwards. At the hospital, we give a report to the doctors and nurses about the patient's condition so that they can give them the best possible onward care. Right, let's look at the kit. So, my most important kit, a defibrillator. It gives a high energy electric shock to a patient if their heart has stopped beating. So you can shock the heart back to working again. It's very clever. Right, we've got a fire extinguisher. We've got a road accident sign. We've got fluids. We've got gloves. We've got mobile phones. We've got a special jacket for wearing if there's a major incident. You need to show up well. We've got their uniform. This is their response bags. That's what they take with them. Their report form for writing down what happened. There's their ambulance. There's their defibrillator. That's the carrying chair. Okay, they've got different kinds of um, things to put patients on. So we've got a stretcher, a scoop stretcher, a rescue board, and a vacuum mattress. So depending on what was wrong with the person, they might need their bodies to be supported in different ways. You've got oxygen cylinders again. Okay, so lots of different things that are essential. And of course, medicine. Right, okay then. So, learnt lots more about some of the people that help us in the medical world. And remember, these jobs can be done by anybody and maybe one day they'll be done by you. I hope you enjoyed it. Bye for now.